Welcome to a swashbuckling session of IntelliQuest's The World's 100 Greatest Books, in which we'll look at the adventure classic The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas the Elder. This enormously popular story, which has been immortalized in more than four films and a candy bar, was an instant hit in France when it was published in 1844. Before we tell the adventures of the brave musketeers, we'll briefly review highlights from the life of Alexandre Dumas the Elder. In our session on the book Camille, which was written by Alexandre Dumas the Younger, we discussed the history of the colorful Dumas family. You may want to review that biography to get a deeper insight into Dumas the Elder, the author we discuss in this session. Briefly, Dumas the Elder was born in France in 1802. His father, the son of a Frenchman and a West Indian woman, was a general in Napoleon's army. He died when Dumas was only four, so Dumas was not born into financial security. Also, Dumas' formal education was sketchy. But he was adventurous and energetic, and when he went to Paris to seek his fortune, he found it. Dumas became a playwright and a novelist, and throughout his adult life he worked and played with some of the most famous and powerful people in Europe. Dumas' specialty was the historical novel, and with the help of a collaborator he wrote scores of books that dramatized French history. There's a famous remark about the amount of Dumas' literary output. No one has ever read everything Dumas wrote, not even Dumas. Although he had assistants who helped with research and plots, reportedly all of Dumas' manuscripts are in his own handwriting. He's attributed with writing a thousand volumes. Some of his books were a few volumes in length. Dumas was an irrepressible man, constantly in debt and frequently in love. He had three children by three different women, none of whom he married. His only son was Alexandre Dumas the Younger, who wrote Camille, the book that became both a play and the classic opera, La Traviata. The Three Musketeers was written as part of a newspaper serial and was published at the height of Dumas' fame, on the heels of his second most famous book, The Count of Monte Cristo. Although he remained famous until his death in 1870, Dumas was always writing to dig himself out from the debts he incurred with his extravagant and irresponsible lifestyle. In addition to historical fictions, Dumas wrote travel books, children's stories, and a highly entertaining autobiography. He died shortly after a last love affair with a world-famous American performer who was much younger than he. Although Dumas' son disapproved of his father's lifestyle, Dumas the Elder died in the care of Dumas the Younger. In a moment, we'll tell you the adventures of France's famous musketeers, named for the musket gun, which was a new invention back then. But first, a note about the accuracy and literary significance of this book. Much of the Three Musketeers is based on historical circumstances. That is to say, there were musketeers who served the King of France in the early 1600s, and there were even people in France who had the same names and similar experiences as some of the characters in the book. We can't take the book as an accurate record, but it does give a reasonably good picture of the political intrigues and aristocratic customs of those times. Dumas said that his intention in creating an historical novel was to interpret history, not to transcribe it. The main historical characters in the novel, King Louis XIII, his wife Anne of Austria, the Duke of Buckingham, Cardinal Richelieu, all lived. But Dumas did not hesitate to manipulate history for the sake of a good story. The Three Musketeers is a fast-paced book that reads as well as the best in today's action thrillers. Granted, it doesn't have the gruesome violence and sexual explicitness of the modern suspense novel, but The Three Musketeers has mystery, charm, humor, romance, and, most important to a musketeer, chivalry. When Dumas wrote this historical romance, he went beyond similar works by Sir Walter Scott, who's also a subject in our series. Whereas Scott and other novelists tediously set a stage for the plot to come through lots of explaining before the story starts, Dumas jumps right in with his plot. Like a good movie, Dumas reveals the character's background as the story naturally unfolds. This is a technique still lacking in many of today's novelists and screenwriters. Now let's tell the story of those brave cavaliers whose motto was one for all and all for one. The main characters are... D'Artagnan, the newest musketeer and the main character, Athos, the aristocratic musketeer, Aramis, who plans to enter the priesthood as soon as the queen provides France with an heir to the throne, Porthos, a courtly musketeer who especially enjoys comfort and wealth, and de Treville, the captain of the king's musketeers. 
Although there are other characters in The Three Musketeers, we'll introduce and explain them as they appear. The book starts out on a spring day in 1625, as the young D'Artagnan journeys to Paris from his country home. He plans to meet the captain of the Musketeers, de Treville, and carries a letter of introduction to the captain. Dumas describes a humorous scene on the first page, as people react to the latest excitement. Dumas writes, At that time panics were frequent. Noblemen were at war with one another. The king was at war with Cardinal Richelieu. Spain was at war with the king. And besides these public and private wars, there were other elements which kept the French countryside in a state of almost perpetual unrest, notable thieves, beggars, and rabble of all sorts. The citizens always took up arms against this rabble. They often fought the noblemen, and sometimes even the king, though never Spain or Cardinal Richelieu. So, from the sheer force of habit, the citizens rushed in a body to the Jolly Miller Inn, prepared for battle. What they find there is not a hostile force, but the hilarious sight of D'Artagnan's horse, a broken-down nag in an age when people were judged by the quality of their horse. What's important in this scene is the atmosphere that Dumas creates so vividly and so immediately. Right away we know that this is a time of political intrigue and hasty tempers. Our hero, D'Artagnan, also has a temper, and he picks a fight with a mysterious nobleman, a fight he loses, and D'Artagnan's carried unconscious into an inn. While D'Artagnan lies unconscious, the nobleman steals D'Artagnan's letter of introduction to de Treville, the captain of the musketeers. When D'Artagnan comes to, he realizes what happened, but too late to stop the mysterious nobleman. All D'Artagnan knows is that he saw the mystery man talking to someone called Milady. D'Artagnan goes to Paris and the musketeers' headquarters, and on his way in to see de Treville, he sees two musketeers, Porthos, who is dressed very elegantly, and the studious Aramis. When D'Artagnan tells de Treville about the mysterious nobleman who stole his letter, de Treville is sure that the stranger is Cardinal Richelieu's assistant. Cardinal Richelieu is one of the most powerful politicians in French history. He had a network of spies throughout the country, and control of France was a silent but never-ending struggle between himself and King Louis XIII. The musketeers are loyal to the king, but Richelieu has his own elite guards. This particular king was not a brilliant ruler, and he relied heavily on Richelieu's advice and influence. De Treville suggests that D'Artagnan forget the incident and avoid the mystery man, but suddenly D'Artagnan sees the nobleman across the street. He rushes out and crashes into the musketeer named Athos, who's recovering from a shoulder wound. Athos challenges D'Artagnan to a sword fight, a duel, at noon. D'Artagnan keeps running, and this time collides with Porthos, who challenges D'Artagnan to a duel at 1 p.m. Now D'Artagnan has lost sight of the mystery man. He accidentally insults the musketeer Aramis and has a third duel appointment at 2 p.m. When D'Artagnan gets to his first duel, he generously offers a home remedy for Athos's injured shoulder. The two start to become friendly, and then Porthos and Aramis arrive. D'Artagnan is surprised and honored that he has challenged the three men known as the Three Musketeers because of their close camaraderie. As Athos and D'Artagnan unsheathe their swords, Five men from Richelieu's elite guard try to arrest the musketeers because there's a law against dueling. The musketeers resist, and in the ensuing fight the outnumbered musketeers overcome the cardinal's guards. D'Artagnan is accepted into the close friendship of the three musketeers, although he's not yet an official member of the king's musketeers' troop. That evening, de Treville goes to see the king and explain the conduct of his musketeers. Dueling is illegal, and the king has already been told by Cardinal Richelieu of the day's incident. Dumas writes, That evening de Treville was present at the king's card game. The king was winning, so this had put him in a good humor. The king says, My dear de Treville, do you realize Richelieu came to see me today to complain about your musketeers? De Treville defends the duel fight, saying, How can the musketeers avoid fighting for the honor of their regiment when the cardinal's guards are always picking quarrels? Your majesty knows, of course, that the musketeers are for the king and the king alone and therefore the natural enemies of the guards who support the cardinal. The king sadly answers, It's distressing to think there are two rival parties in France, two heads of state, but all that will end soon. The king is actually pleased by the loyal and skillful actions of the musketeers against the cardinal's guard, and tells de Treville to bring the musketeers and d'Artagnan for a private audience the next day. The king wants to thank them personally, but he suggests that the musketeers come up through the back stairs, so that Richelieu won't know of the visit. Dumas writes, De Treville smiled to himself 
It was quite an achievement to have persuaded this royal infant to revolt against his master, the cardinal. A note here about Richelieu. Although he seems devious, we need to remember that Louis XIII was an inept king. Richelieu filled a power vacuum in France, and although the musketeers show a chivalrous support of their king, we will also see that Richelieu has his good side and cared for the welfare of France. The next day, as the three musketeers and D'Artagnan play tennis, D'Artagnan is insulted by one of the cardinal's swordsmen. They duel, and the duel escalates into a brawl when other musketeers and guards to the cardinal join in. Once again, de Treville has to explain to the king that the cardinal's guard started the fight. So impressed is the king with his expert swordsman that he rewards D'Artagnan with a good sum of money, which D'Artagnan divides with his comrades. Now the four swordsmen travel together. The reward is soon spent, and the musketeers quickly spend a salary advance. Then they're broke. This is a theme throughout the book, as the musketeers scramble for funds at times and lavishly entertain themselves at others. This feast and famine lifestyle is similar to Alexandre Dumas. D'Artagnan's late with his rent, and his landlord comes to have a talk. He mentions to D'Artagnan that his wife Constance has been kidnapped. The landlord believes that the abduction was politically motivated because his wife Constance is one of the Queen's handmaids. The Queen, whose title is Anne of Austria, is in a precarious position. She's Spanish by birth and out of favor with the Cardinal, who once loved her. Also, she's in love with the Duke of Buckingham, an English nobleman. Since England and France are enemies, this is another blow to the Queen's credibility. As D'Artagnan's landlord asks help in finding his kidnapped wife, D'Artagnan spots the mystery man across the street and unsuccessfully pursues him. Later, D'Artagnan tells his comrades that they need to rescue Constance, who was kidnapped because of her faithful service to the Queen. The musketeers agree that the Queen deserves their assistance, despite her ties to Spain and her love for an Englishman. Constance's husband is arrested and taken to the infamous Parisian prison, the Bastille. After his arrest, D'Artagnan removes some of the floorboards in his room so that he can hear the guards who are stationed in the landlord's house to entrap Constance should she return. Finally, D'Artagnan hears Constance return. When she's threatened by the guards, he runs to her rescue. It's four to one, but D'Artagnan masterfully overcomes his opponents. During the fight, Dumas writes, the neighbors had opened their windows and watched with the indifference common to Parisians of that date. Once the guards are gone, Constance, a beautiful young woman, tells D'Artagnan about her abductor. D'Artagnan knows that it's the mysterious man he's been pursuing. Constance impresses D'Artagnan by describing her own brave escape from the mystery man's clutches, tying sheets together and lowering herself out a window. D'Artagnan leaves, already infatuated with Constance, and meanders around the streets of Paris thinking of her. Later that night, he finds Constance on a bridge with a stranger. When he approaches them, Constance says that the man is the Duke of Buckingham on his way to a secret meeting with the Queen. D'Artagnan, ever the gallant romantic, escorts the two to the palace. When he finally reaches the Queen, Buckingham declares his love, flinging himself at her feet and kissing the hem of her dress. But the Queen says, I'm only seeing you to convince you that everything stands between us, not only the sea and the hostility that exists between our countries, but also the vows we've both made. We must never meet again. Buckingham promises to go if she gives him a token of her love. So with great sadness, the queen gives him a box that holds twelve little diamond studs. Meanwhile, Constance's husband is interrogated by the cardinal. Cardinal Richelieu, a crafty and persuasive man, wins his prisoner's loyalty and then releases him. The cardinal decides to use the man in his schemes against the queen. Later, knowing of the gift the Queen made to Buckingham, the Cardinal goes to the King with an idea. He suggests that the King give a grand ball, so that the Queen can indulge her love of dancing. Richelieu tells the King to insist that the Queen wear the twelve beautiful diamond tags the King gave her as a present. The King does this, and the Queen is terrified that her gift to Buckingham will be discovered. Constance reassures the Queen, saying she knows someone brave enough to go to the Duke of Buckingham in England and retrieve the jewels before the ball. Constance goes home and realizes that her husband is now on Richelieu's side and would even betray Constance if he knew she wanted to help the Queen. Constance tells D'Artagnan about the Queen's dilemma and gives D'Artagnan a large sum of money to finance a trip to England to get the diamond studs back before the ball. The money that Constance gives D'Artagnan was given to her husband by the Cardinal to buy her husband's loyalty. D'Artagnan enjoys using the Cardinal's money in service to the Queen. 
When D'Artagnan goes to de Treville, the captain of the musketeers, de Treville suggests that D'Artagnan keep these court intrigues to himself. But de Treville approves the three musketeers' assistance for D'Artagnan in the mission to retrieve the diamond studs. The musketeers agree and go along without even knowing the mission. They leave by dark of night to catch a boat to England. Along the way, three of the musketeers meet fights and other forms of opposition, and one by one are waylaid. D'Artagnan promises to come back for his companions when his job is finished, but for the moment he goes alone to England. After a brief duel to get a permit to board a ship, the cardinal has blocked the forts, D'Artagnan sails to England. When he reaches London, D'Artagnan is momentarily at a disadvantage. He doesn't understand a word of English. Luckily, the Duke of Buckingham has a servant who speaks French. D'Artagnan describes his mission, and the Duke goes to retrieve the twelve diamond studs. To his horror, Buckingham sees that he has only ten studs. He realizes that the only opportunity anyone had to take the studs was when he wore them recently to a ball, and danced with a certain Lady de Winter, the most likely suspect for having stolen two diamond studs. Lady de Winter is also the woman D'Artagnan knows as Milady, the woman D'Artagnan saw speaking with the mystery man at the beginning of the book. Buckingham, a very powerful English nobleman, has all the forts closed so that Milady can't get back to France with the two diamond studs. He has replacements made, and in less than a day D'Artagnan is back in Paris with the Queen's alibi. The ball is held the next day, a major event of the royal social scene. The cardinal tells the king that his wife has only ten diamond tags, and he gives the king two more to replace those that are gone. When the king and queen dance together, the king says that she's missing two diamonds, and gives her the two from the cardinal. The queen points out that she already has twelve tags, and this will make fourteen. The king angrily turns on the cardinal and asks what's going on. Richelieu, smooth as silk, says that this is just his way of giving the queen a gift. But the queen knows better, and she knows to what lengths Richelieu went to have the studs stolen. She says to Richelieu, Your eminence is too good. I realize that these two tags alone must have cost you as much as the other twelve cost his majesty. D'Artagnan is later rewarded in a secret meeting with the queen, who gives him a beautiful ring. When D'Artagnan tells de Treville about his adventures in England, de Treville suggests that D'Artagnan sell the queen's gift and leave Paris for a time. De Treville is afraid that Richelieu will want revenge. D'Artagnan agrees to leave Paris the next day, but that evening he has a meeting with Constance. When D'Artagnan goes to meet her, he discovers the room in a shocking disarray. Once again, Constance has been kidnapped by the mystery man and with the help of her own husband. D'Artagnan decides to follow de Treville's advice, and he leaves Paris, retracing his steps the night he left with the three musketeers for England. Each of them had a particular adventure that waylaid him, and now D'Artagnan learns more about his comrades as he retraces their route and sees what happened to them. He first goes to an inn where Porthos got into an argument with a stranger. The innkeeper says that Porthos was seriously wounded in a duel and has also run up a huge debt and lost all his money gambling. D'Artagnan also discovers the identity of Porthos's mistress, a woman he told the other musketeers was a beautiful duchess. The duchess is actually the middle-aged wife of an attorney. Porthos has written her a letter asking for money. After finding all this out, D'Artagnan visits Porthos, who pretends that his only injury is from tripping and hurting his knee. Then D'Artagnan goes to visit Aramis, who insists that he's given up the world, including women, and will soon enter the priesthood. D'Artagnan tells Aramis that if that's the case, Aramis is probably not interested in seeing a perfumed letter D'Artagnan has with him. Aramis grabs the note, reads it, and forgets his previous ideas. He says, Oh, D'Artagnan, you can't think how grateful I am to you for bringing this letter. My lover hasn't left me for someone else. She still loves me. Aramis throws aside his austere principles and drinks to D'Artagnan's health. Next, D'Artagnan rides to the inn where he left Athos. The night D'Artagnan went to Paris, Athos was accosted at the inn by four armed men. When D'Artagnan talks to the innkeeper, he realizes that the attack on Athos was part of the cardinal's plan to thwart D'Artagnan on his mission for the queen. The innkeeper tells D'Artagnan that after winning the fight with the four ruffians, Athos barricaded himself in the basement of the inn. He's been there ever since, eating all the innkeeper's food stores and drinking the best wine. The innkeeper is almost bankrupt from Athos's excesses. D'Artagnan ransoms Athos and takes him to supper. That night, D'Artagnan learns a great deal about Athos, the musketeer he most admires for his aristocratic manner. 
Athos tells D'Artagnan the story of a man he knows, a close friend who married a beautiful woman. D'Artagnan can tell that this friend is really Athos in disguise. Athos says of the woman his friend married, She had a poet's mind. She was more than charming. She was enchanting. She lived in a little village with her brother, the local priest. But one day on a hunting trip she fell from her horse and became unconscious. Her husband saw on her shoulder a brand, a brand that was the symbol for a hardened criminal. Devastated at her corruption and her untruthfulness, her husband, the ruler of this province, with the rights of a judge, hanged her to a tree. Athos tells D'Artagnan that the so-called priest was not the woman's brother, but her lover and accomplice. D'Artagnan sympathizes with Athos's bitter disillusion with love. The next morning, D'Artagnan is very annoyed to discover that Athos has gambled away their horses. They return to Paris and find Aramis and Porthos have also lost their horses. They also discover that they need to leave in a few weeks to fight in a battle, and none of them has the money to buy equipment. Porthos goes to church, where he plans to approach his mistress, the attorney's wife whom he calls a duchess. D'Artagnan follows Porthos, who upbraids his mistress for not responding to a letter requesting money. They reconcile over holy water, and she agrees to help. But while D'Artagnan was watching Porthos, he also saw a beautiful woman in black in the church, and recognizes her as Milady. This is the infamous Lady de Winter, who stole the diamond studs while dancing with the Duke of Buckingham, a woman in league with the Cardinal. D'Artagnan follows Milady, and has his servant intercept a note from Milady to a young man named Count de Ward. It's a love note, and Milady is asking de Ward to visit her. Later, D'Artagnan follows Milady while she takes a carriage ride with a man. When he hears them argue, D'Artagnan can control his chivalrous instincts and intervenes in their discussion on her behalf. He challenges the man that Milady is arguing with, her brother-in-law, Lord de Winter. Although Milady tells D'Artagnan she's not in danger, after she goes, the men agree to a duel. They decide to each bring three friends to extend the scope of the fight. D'Artagnan goes to the three musketeers, saying that an exciting fight is in store. When the duel takes place, D'Artagnan skillfully disarms Lord de Winter, but spares his life, in return for an introduction to the irresistible Milady. Lord de Winter takes D'Artagnan to Milady's home, and Milady seems slightly annoyed that her brother-in-law is still alive. D'Artagnan falls in love with Milady, although he's warned against her by her charming maid Kitty. Kitty arranges for D'Artagnan to overhear Milady talk about her misdeeds by hiding D'Artagnan in a closet. D'Artagnan hears Milady say to Kitty that D'Artagnan is a stupid country bumpkin who keeps getting in her way. She's especially annoyed that D'Artagnan didn't kill Lord de Winter. If Lord de Winter were dead, Milady would have a huge inheritance. She says, I'd have revenged myself on D'Artagnan before now, but for some reason the cardinal asked me to deal gently with him. Milady is also behind Constance's kidnapping and takes pleasure in knowing she's caused pain to someone D'Artagnan loves. Milady leaves the room and D'Artagnan pulls Kitty into the closet where he's been hiding. He makes love to Kitty, even though he's infatuated with Constance and also lusting after Milady. We need to take a moment here to recall the times and personality of the author Alexandre Dumas. Dumas was a man of sensual excess and measured his self-worth by his ability to seduce women and survive difficult situations. He no doubt admired the kind of improbable scrapes that his musketeers got themselves into. Dumas probably saw their manipulative and dishonest relationships with women as another kind of conquest. This is certainly not a humanistic or even realistic attitude, but it's part of Western civilization's hero culture, which unfortunately extends into today's books and films. So D'Artagnan rationalizes his actions, seducing Kitty while plotting to go to bed with Milady, and meanwhile trying to free Constance because he's infatuated with her, too. D'Artagnan intercepts another love letter from Milady to Count de Ward and writes an answer in the Count's name, making a date with her. The next day he visits the Musketeers. In a humorous turn of events, Porthos's mistress, the attorney's wife, has sent in return to his request for money the broken-down old horse that D'Artagnan had at the beginning of the book. Porthos is indignant, but hopes he'll soon get something better. D'Artagnan tells Athos about Milady, and in complete darkness makes a visit to her bedroom as Count de Ward. Milady doesn't recognize D'Artagnan and gives him a sapphire ring surrounded by diamonds as a token of her love for the man she thinks is Count de Ward. The next day, when Athos sees the ring on D'Artagnan's hand, he turns pale. Athos is sure that this is the ring he gave to his wife, the branded woman he loved but hanged. 
Kitty comes to D'Artagnan with a note that Milady wrote to Count de Ward, asking him to visit her. D'Artagnan forges another note, saying that de Ward is busy with other mistresses and he'll get to Milady as soon as he can. Milady is furious and, in keeping with her malevolent personality, decides to avenge herself. She writes to D'Artagnan, knowing his chivalrous attitude. Milady asks D'Artagnan to destroy de Ward and gives herself to him in return for D'Artagnan's promise to kill de Ward in a duel. D'Artagnan convinces himself that she must really love him, just as he's obsessed with her. Dumas writes, Some still small voice did indeed whisper to D'Artagnan that he was only an instrument of vengeance for her, but pride and his insane passion silenced that voice. After they make love, D'Artagnan reveals that he impersonated de Ward when they made love previously. Milady attacks him with such violence that her nightgown is torn. On her shoulder is the brand of a criminal, and when D'Artagnan sees it, she attacks him with a knife. She's like a monster filled with hatred. Kitty helps D'Artagnan escape by disguising him as a woman. Wearing a dress, he rushes to Athos and tells him that Milady has a brand on her shoulder, just like Athos's wife. They pawn the ring to buy equipment for the upcoming battle and send Kitty away. D'Artagnan receives a letter from the Cardinal requesting an interview. At their meeting it becomes clear that the Cardinal has been watching D'Artagnan's every move. The Cardinal offers D'Artagnan an important position in his guards and suggests that D'Artagnan could benefit from the Cardinal's protection. D'Artagnan refuses. His heart is with the musketeers. The Cardinal says that he has no personal grudge against D'Artagnan and will wait and see how D'Artagnan performs in the upcoming battle at La Rochelle. This battle is important to the Cardinal because La Rochelle was the last door open to England in France. It pits the French against the English, and the Queen is in love with an Englishman. If the battle goes well, the Cardinal has two successes, one for France and the other a triumph over the Queen's lover and the Queen. Unfortunately, the musketeers can't go to battle because the King is ill and they must stay behind with him. D'Artagnan, who's still not officially a musketeer, goes to La Rochelle and on a number of occasions is ambushed. These ambushes are, however, not the work of the enemy, but of Milady. D'Artagnan becomes quite the hero, and well known in his troop for his bravery and intelligence. Soon after, the three musketeers find themselves in an awkward situation when they're forced to accompany the cardinal to an inn for a secret mission. The cardinal asks the musketeers to wait while he goes upstairs for a meeting. Due to the convenience of a broken pipe, the musketeers overhear the cardinal, who's plotting with Milady. He tells Milady to go to the Duke of Buckingham and tell him to stop his aggression against France. The cardinal threatens to blackmail Buckingham with his love for the queen, and says that he can arrange for the queen to be imprisoned on charges of conspiring with an enemy of France. The cardinal tells Milady that if Buckingham still continues, she's authorized to kill him. Milady asks the cardinal to do a similar favor for her. She asks that both Constance and D'Artagnan be killed. Then Milady gets from the cardinal a letter saying that whoever bears this letter is the cardinal's agent and acting for the benefit of France. The cardinal leaves with two musketeers as a guard. Athos remains and confronts Milady, who is amazed and terrified to see her former husband. Athos almost kills her, but instead takes the cardinal's letter. The three musketeers go to D'Artagnan. They look for a safe place to talk where they won't be overheard and go to a temporarily abandoned enemy encampment. They know they'll have complete privacy here, although the enemy could return at any moment. As they eat breakfast, the musketeers brief D'Artagnan on Milady's conversation with the cardinal. They're interrupted by a group of soldiers and workmen. But using the muskets left behind by the enemy, the musketeers blithely scare away the soldiers and resume their talk. They decide to warn Lord de Winter and Buckingham about Milady's treachery and are again interrupted by enemy soldiers. They shoot a number of the soldiers and push a wall on top of the rest of them. Then they go back to their side of the battlefield. By the time Milady reaches England, her brother-in-law de Winter has already been warned. He has her locked up in his castle and assigns a devoted Puritan, his assistant John Felton, to guard Milady. De Winter warns Felton of Milady's treachery, but Felton is not prepared for the wealth of wicked talents that Milady possesses. Over the next few days of captivity, Milady skillfully discovers that Felton is a religious fanatic and a devoted Puritan. The Puritans at that time were a persecuted religious sect who believed in repentance. Their persecution in Europe led many of them to seek a new life in America. Milady plays the part of a religious victim, a spiritual penitent, 
she sings hymns and prays aloud to God, begging forgiveness. Felton is eventually overcome by her apparent religious fervor. Milady tells him a fantastic story about her youth, full of graphic and sadistic details and culminating in her cruel treatment at the hands of De Winter and the Duke of Buckingham. Felton can't resist her sensual confessions and believes that Milady has been horribly taken advantage of. He helps her escape and, under the spell of lust for her mixed with his own religious fanaticism, he stabs Buckingham. Milady flees to France. Meanwhile, in France, the king becomes bored with the siege of La Rochelle and takes the musketeers back to Paris. The musketeers get permission to go to a convent where Constance is in hiding. Before they get there, Milady appears. Milady pretends to be a persecuted woman in need of help and is shown a room. After a nap, Milady awakens to see before her Constance, although the two have never met. They talk, and Milady realizes Constance's identity. She sees a chance to kill one of the Queen's most loyal handmaids, while also causing great pain to D'Artagnan. Constance lets it slip that D'Artagnan will soon be there at the convent, and right then Milady has a visitor, the mystery man, who is actually Count de Rochefort, the Cardinal's assistant. Milady updates him on everything so that he can report back to the Cardinal. Then Milady, seeing the musketeers approach, takes poison from her ring and puts it into Constance's glass of wine. Constance drinks the wine, Milady flees, and the musketeers discover Constance, who dies in D'Artagnan's arms after identifying her murderer. Athos insists that he be in charge of the revenge against Milady, as she was his wife. That night Athos goes out for a walk in search of something that terrifies everyone. Dumas doesn't reveal what Athos is looking for, only that everyone he meets points him in one direction. Finally, Athos reaches a small house where he asks a question of a large man who fearfully refuses Athos's request until Athos presents the cardinal's letter. This letter, which Milady obtained from Richelieu, says that whoever has it is doing the cardinal's work. The big man agrees to Athos's mysterious request. Dumas does not say what it is or who the man is. Athos then discovers Milady's whereabouts, and that night, during a raging storm, the musketeers surround Milady's secret cottage. Athos, D'Artagnan, Porthos, Aramis, Lord de Winter, and the tall man take the cottage by storm. They recite Milady's long list of crimes, from the death of Constance to the corruption of John Felton. Now the tall man steps forward and says that he is the official executioner. It was he who branded her for her original crime of seducing her brother, a priest. The brother later hanged himself. Each man pronounces her with the death penalty, and Milady is dragged to the river and tied hand and foot. Dumas writes, Her screams were so dreadful that D'Artagnan, who had at first been the most eager in pursuit of her, now sank down on the stump of a tree, groaned and put his hands to his ears to block out the sound. Milady cried out, D'Artagnan, D'Artagnan, remember I loved you. Remember our hours of perfect happiness together. But Athos tells the executioner to do his job, and the executioner cuts off her head and wraps her body and head in his cloak, which he throws in the river. The wicked villain of the story is dead, and the mystery is over, and there are plenty of bodies littering the path. But for some the ending is happy. The king's pleased because Lord Buckingham is dead, so the king's lost both a personal and a political rival. D'Artagnan's longtime enemy, the mystery man named Count de Rochefort, tries to arrest D'Artagnan, but the musketeers promise to deliver D'Artagnan to the cardinal themselves. At their meeting, Richelieu tells D'Artagnan that he's under arrest for conspiracy and interfering with France's security. D'Artagnan points out that the cardinal's witness to these so-called crimes was a villain and a criminal herself. He tells Richelieu the horrible story of Milady, including her ugly death. The cardinal still thinks D'Artagnan should stand trial. D'Artagnan arrogantly says he already has the cardinal's pardon and pulls out the letter that Athos got from Milady, the letter granting complete freedom to the person who bears it. There's a silence. Dumas writes, The young man muttered to himself, He's thinking out what kind of torture to inflict on me. Well, I'll show him I can die bravely. And D'Artagnan indulged in fantasies of himself dying a hero's death on the scaffold. Richelieu still sat lost in thought, screwing the scroll of paper round in his hand. At last he looked up and fixed his eagle eye on D'Artagnan. When he saw D'Artagnan's honest, open, intelligent look and realized from the tears which were coursing down D'Artagnan's cheeks how greatly D'Artagnan had suffered during the past month, Richelieu was struck for the third or fourth time 
by the brilliant possibilities in store for this youth of twenty and saw treasures of energy, courage, and resource. Richelieu compared the qualities of the young man in front of him with Milady's diabolical genius, her sinister intrigues and many crimes, and knew in his heart of hearts that he was on the whole thankful to be rid of such a dangerous accomplice. Instead of a trial and the gallows, D'Artagnan becomes a first lieutenant in the musketeers. But the adventure doesn't end until D'Artagnan fights a number of duels with his former enemy, the mystery man. Then the cardinal orders them to be friends. So our adventure has come full circle, with D'Artagnan going from a simple country boy to an officer in the musketeers. The greatness of this novel is in what we would call today an escapist plot. The history is interesting, the characters are entertaining, and there's plenty of humor and color to hold together a fast-paced narrative. Don't look for tremendous depths of meaning, and don't be offended by Dumas' violent and negligent attitudes towards women. He thought of himself as a gallant gentleman, and it probably never occurred to him that the only intelligent and interesting female character in his epic was a sociopathic criminal. But really, this book is meant to entertain, and if it gives deeper insights, they are more about the life of Alexandre Dumas the Elder than about our own lives. This is the end of the session.